It's day 364 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. Welcome to Bible study. Ooh, just one more day. Oh my goodness. This just feels really unreal. I don't know if it does for you, or maybe surreal is what I should say. Okay, well, before we get into the thick of Revelation, could you please just give us one second to last like on this video? Hit that like button. Please make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you plan to stick around and also hit that notification bell so that you know when the videos come out each day. Also join us in our Facebook group if you want to continue the conversation after Bible study is over. And don't forget to check out our website, heartdive.org. We are answering all the questions there. You have access to our Bible reading plan for next year, Heart Dive 365. I hope that you are joining us. And also you can find our podcast links on our website as well. I'll have everything linked below. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put those in the comments so that we are able to make sure that you are set up. Keep an eye out for a couple of videos that will be coming out between today and tomorrow to help you prep for Heart Dive 365. Otherwise, we're going to pray because they have given us a lot of chapters to cover on this second to last day of the year. So our Father who art in heaven, we love you. We honor you. We worship you. We stand here in humility and in awe of who you are, a healthy, holy fear in reverence because you are almighty. I thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done for us, everything that you give to us, the way that you bless us whenever we are so undeserving of it. Please forgive us of our sins, Lord, where we have missed the mark, where we have stepped over the line, or where we have not obeyed in listening to you and doing the things that you have asked of us. If we have not been aware of those things, Lord, I pray that you will reveal them to us now so that we can get it right, we can make our hearts pure and clean before you, and so that we are open and ready to receive your word and to listen to your voice. So I pray that our eyes and our ears and our hearts will be open to be able to do just that today. May our hearts be good soil, Lord, where the seeds that are planted will be able to flourish and bear good fruit. Also help us to forgive others who have hurt us, Lord, for we know that if we hold on to that unforgiveness, that is taking up room in our heart where you cannot bless, you cannot fill. And so I just pray that we'll get rid of all the junk in our hearts right now so that we can be filled afresh with your Holy Spirit. We ask for guidance today. We ask for wisdom. We ask for knowledge. We ask for understanding of your word with accuracy and fullness of truth. Lord, will you speak through me? Don't let my own self get in the way, but I just pray that I will be sensitive to your spirit and to your voice and allowing you to just flow through me. Please do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we left off in chapter 11 yesterday with the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And here we start off in chapter 12. And a great sign appeared in heaven. So John's still in the heavenly realm in his vision. And a woman clothed with the sun. So this woman, it is debated about who she is. Some have said this is the church. Some say this is the believing Jews. But most scholars and who we are kind of going with today, it is Israel. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and her head, a crown of 12 stars. And so the reason why we say this has got to be Israel is because this is synonymous with the image that we see in Gen uh, Genesis chapter 37 of Israel and these 12 stars, the crown with the 12 stars is representing the 12 tribes or even the 12 apostles. Now she was pregnant. And so some people say, well, this has got to be Mary. I think Catholicism uh, promotes that this is Mary that we're speaking of. But again, we're going with Israel and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in the heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and on his head, seven diadems. And so this is a picture of Satan in all of his brilliance, his seven heads and his power. That is the 10 horns. Remember, t horns is a sign of power and the seven diadems or crowns his apparent glory. <laughs> His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. So this is symbolic of the third of the angels that fell when he fell from glory to disgrace. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now remember the influence that Herod was under by Satan to kill Jesus after he was born. 
She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And of course, this will come to full fruition whenever he comes back in his second coming. But her child was caught up to God. So this is the ascension and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. So this is where we say, okay, this has got to be Israel because we know that she was taken into the wilderness. But of course, with this being prophetic, we are looking ahead to the time when the protected Jews will be taken to a place prepared by God. And some scholars say this has got to be Petra, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. So from the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, this is speaking of the final three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. Verse 7, now war arose in heaven and Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Michael is an archangel. This is not a depiction of Jesus. And so he is fighting off the enemy now because heaven is no longer accessible to him. Because remember in Job, whenever Satan had accessibility to heaven, to the throne of God, well, he's no longer going to have that as the angels fight off him and the demons. So he will now be limited to earth. This is the midpoint of the tribulation. And of course, we know Michael is the head of the angelic host and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. Hallelujah. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. So this is the second fall of Satan. We'll see two more happen. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. So remember, he was in heaven constantly spewing accusations before the father of those who are coming into heaven and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony so of course the blood of the lamb happening through the crucifixion overcoming satan's accusations against mankind and by the word of their testimony meaning the believers and this is overcoming satan's deception for they loved not their lives, even unto death. And this is speaking of the martyrs who overcome the violence of Satan. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth, and see, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So he is soon going to be thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and he knows it. So now he's going to wreak extra havoc. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. So he's continuing to pursue Israel. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and a half time. So this is referring to that time period in Daniel chapter 9, when he spoke about the 70th week. Now the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to help of the woman and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Another reason why we say this is Israel, because if this was simply Mary, then who would the rest of the offspring be? And so these are the Gentiles who come to the faith during the tribulation. So very much so two targets in the end times, Israel and believers. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So he is now desperately trying to oppose every trace of faith that is left on earth. Chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Now remember the sea in the Bible often represents chaos or evil. With 10 horns and 7 heads, with 10 diadems on its horns and a blasphemous name on its heads and blasphemous names on its heads. So with the seven heads, he's going to be hard to kill. You figure you take out one head, you still got six left. Then his 10 diadems showing his rule over possibly 10 nations and its horns showing his strength and power. And verse two, the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And so these creatures here are actually the same visions that we saw in Daniel chapter 7 that were likened to the lion being the Babylonian Empire, the bear being the Medo-Persian Empire, and the leopard being the Greek Empire. 
and of course the fourth beast being the Antichrist. But when we look at how it applies to this time and what John is seeing, this is the final world empire that will be ruled by the Antichrist. So he will have cat-like vigilance of a leopard, slow crushing power of a bear, and the authority and ferociousness of a lion. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. So he is going to be killed probably in the end, but with the wound being healed, it's almost as if he's coming back to life. So mocking or replicating the resurrection of Jesus, which is why so many people, the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? So we are now seeing his fame increasing here. And at one time, this could have seemed so far-fetched. But if you look at some particular nations who do actually worship their leader, there are statues that are erected. They bow down to him, namely places in Asia. It is not so far-fetched for us to see this in the end times as well, especially when it is someone who seems to come in peace, who seems to come with all of the answers to all of the world's problems, because he's not going to come as a beast, he's going to come disguised as an angel of light, the same way that Satan does today. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. So he is still under God's authority. He's only given limited authority. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. So perhaps those who were raptured, he's speaking against. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints, so all of those who are believers and still alive, and to conquer them. So isn't that interesting that he is going to be allowed to conquer those who are still left? So this will lead to the idea that the church is indeed raptured, because remember when Jesus said that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, the fact that these saints are being conquered tells us that this is not the church. These are believers who are saved during the tribulation. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone who has an ear, let him hear. So this is a very solemn warning here now. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. So there will be widespread persecution at this time, and it should not come as a surprise. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So in other words, there really will be no hope to be able to rise up against the Antichrist in this time. So we must have patience and endurance during this time, knowing and trusting that God will vindicate. So there we saw the first beast, which was the Antichrist himself, the second beast now rising up, who is what we believe a false prophet who promotes the worship of the Antichrist. Then I saw another beast rising up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. Now, this is the only time that the lamb is not Jesus in the New Testament. So definitely not Jesus here. And it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So he is now saying, we need to erect a statue of this leader, this amazing leader, so that we can all worship him. And this is also strikingly similar to the two witnesses who would breathe out fire upon those who oppose them. This person is very persuasive and will be able to deceive the masses. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. So those who do not bow down to him are going to be killed. Also, it causes all both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast, 
or the number of its name. And so isn't it interesting that this is an evil counterfeit of the mark on the foreheads of the 144,000? So this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. So this number is key for identifying the Antichrist. Now, a couple of things here that I want to point out that if we are still for some reason here during the tribulation and we start to recognize the Antichrist, he will be associated with the number 666. I don't believe that this is going to be some deeply rooted cryptic number that no one can figure out and only elite few will be able to understand this number. I believe that it will be obvious, at least to the believers. I also don't believe that this is something that you will accidentally take, like getting a vaccine. I remember when COVID was around, people were saying, it's the mark of the beast. If you take the vaccine, then you are marked. While it will be deceptive, it will not be accidental. And it will be associated with the worship of the Antichrist. Because we saw here in verse 16 that the worship of the beast caused all of these people to receive the mark. So if anything, we need to be focused on not worshiping anything other than Jesus, other than God himself. So our focus should not be so much on the Antichrist and obsessing over who he is and what these numbers mean and constantly looking around for him. We need to be focused on Jesus. And when you focus on Jesus, you're not going to need to worry about the Antichrist because he will give you the wisdom that you will need to be able to stand up against him. He will give you that endurance and that faith that is necessary. And if you just type in the number 666 into YouTube, you will go down a rabbit hole of all kinds of people and meanings and calculations of who people think that it is or will be or should be. And it really does become such an obsessive thing. I'm not saying don't be aware, but just be careful about what you start to put your energy into because you really could spend that time going down that rabbit hole in the word of God, in worship, which is a much more beneficial place to be. Chapter 14, then I looked and behold on Mount Zion. And so you ask, is this the earthly Mount Zion or is this the heavenly Mount Zion? I'm going with earthly. Stood the lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. So this is a song of redemption and victory. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So we are seeing victory here. We are seeing that the 144,000 make it into heaven. They are redeemed. They are received by God as first fruits, which means there will be an even greater harvest after this. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women for they were virgins. So this is saying that they were spiritually pure and did not compromise. Doesn't mean they were without sin, but they were following the Lord. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits. There it is for God and the lamb and in their mouth, no lie was found for they are blameless. So again, they had that unfaltering faith, not necessarily without sin, but their faith stood strong. So here we see two very distinct marks of these people is that they rejected the lies of the Antichrist, but they also refused to get the mark of the beast. Verse six, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and every tribe and language and people. So how is this going to happen? How will an angel fly directly overhead? Could it be through technology? Well, we don't know, but the amazing thing is that he is still giving an opportunity for those who are left to be saved. And this is a fulfillment of Matthew chapter 24 where everyone is being preached to. This doesn't mean that we don't need to do our work in preaching to the nations, but we see a fulfillment here of it fully coming to pass. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And what's interesting here is this is the only place in the New Testament where we see an angel actually preaching the gospel and not man. Now, another angel, a second, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, 
We'll read more about the fall of Babylon in chapter 17. The great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on its forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So that just goes to show that the presence of the angels and the presence of Jesus will actually be in hell, but not in the way that we know it. It will only be there by way of judgment. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So here we're seeing a depiction of hell. And here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So blessed are the martyrs. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds followed them. So there is a special reward for those who do die in the name of Jesus. So this is the second beatitude in Revelation. And I think yesterday I said that the or maybe it was the day before we saw the first and second. So I guess those two blessed that we read about, and was it in chapter one? I forget what chapter it was in, but there were two different blessed, but those were actually the first. This is the second. Verse 14, then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man. So one like Jesus with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. Now this word ripe is the Greek word that means to become dry or withered. So this is implying that the earth is overly ripe, and that means it is overly worthy of judgment by God. So God never rushes into his judgment. He waits until it is overly ripe, until people are well past the point of no return. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And this wine press are those large troughs where people would walk around barefoot to produce the wine. So this is speaking of major bloodshed that will take place. And by the way, this verse here was the inspiration behind the battle hymn of the Republic. If you remember that song, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has trampled all the wine press of the something, something stored. I forget the words, but his truth is marching on, which to me, I was like, I don't like the fact that we wrote a battle hymn in the name of scripture here, which spoke of God's judgment upon the world. I don't know. To me, I was just kind of like, I didn't realize that that's where it came from. But that was just an, an initial feeling. And the wine press was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia or 184 miles, nearly 200 miles. So that is a lot of bloodshed that is taking place here. Chapter 15, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. So these seven plagues are not the same as the seven trumpets. They're very similar, but we are going to see even more widespread destruction than the trumpets brought. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass, which is the place of worship before the throne of God. And this is a place of victory for all who overcome. So a sea of glass mingled with fire, fire, of course, being a sign of judgment and his judgment now being at its peak. And also those who had conquered the beast, meaning the triumphant martyrs, and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. So there's a whole lot of worshiping going on. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying... 
So this is coming from Exodus chapter 15. Great and amazing are your deeds or your works, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, so hear his worthiness, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, so here we see worship, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So this was a song that was sung in celebration of their exodus from Egypt. It was also sung by Jews on the Sabbath day and the early Christians of the early church on Easter. But now this is a song being sung by the true worshipers. And notice how many times it says you and your in here. There's a your, 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 you, you, and your. So that just goes to show us that true worship is always about God and it is not about us. Now, after this, I looked and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened and out of the sanctuary. So by God's authority came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. So they are clothed in purity and righteousness, showing their spotless justice. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels, seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled. Filled with the smoke or the presence of the glory of God from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So here we are seeing that judgment of God being irreversible. Chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So this voice is the voice of God because he's the only one in the temple. So the first angel went out and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. And then the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. And remember in the second trumpet where the seas were affected, but it only killed a third. Now every living creature being killed. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood and not just bitter like they were in the third trumpet. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the almighty, true and just are your judgments. And so basically they are being forced to drink the blood to avenge the deaths of the martyrs and the prophets and the believers. Now the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. So we are seeing the sun now being intensified instead of diminished the way that it was with the fourth trumpet. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. So we are seeing now the destruction of world power and those who are unrepentant. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of a false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of the of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays away. So there's the third beatitude, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Armageddon translates to Mount of Megiddo. So with the drying of the Euphrates, that will make the invasion from the east a lot easier. And we are seeing this wrath now being poured out against the demonic army and the kings now willing to wage war against God. So we will see the final battle between good and evil with the battle of Armageddon. And now in the seventh bowl, we see the climax of God's judgment. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done or it is finished. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was the earthquake. So if you think you have seen a huge earthquake in this life, 
imagine what will take place in this final judgment. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So Babylon is argued to either be a rebuilt ancient city of Babylon, Rome, or just the proud human society in general. But regardless of what it is, it is indeed a proud human society. And every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, I mean, that's like the size of my child, fell from heaven on people and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. And now we take a look here in chapter 17, more detail about Babylon and about the Antichrist and all of the corruption that is taking place. So this is the great prostitute who symbolizes the city, the great city or quote Babylon and the beast, the one who rules over it. So in this chapter, it is epitomized by organized idolatry, blasphemy, and persecution of the Christians. So we're mainly focusing on the religious corruption that will take place in these last days. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on the many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So they are drunk with power, materialism, false worship, and pride. And this many waters, the fact that the great prostitute is seated on them means that this city rules over many people's nations and tongues. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and 10 horns. And remember, we were talking about the 10 nation confederacy that will be set up in the end times. So these 10 horns representing the 10 kings. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. So on the outside, she looks like royalty. This is the perspective from people or from man. But we will see the godly perspective because remember, people look on the outward appearance, but God looks at the inward or at the heart. So looking like royalty on the outside, but inwardly wicked. And on her forehead was written, the name of the mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. In other words, they hate the Christians. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. Now, John is looking at this like, whoa, what is going on here? But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and 10 horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. So this is opposite of who God is, the one who was and is and is to come. So when we talk about the beast you saw was, that means that this beast has manifested itself before. It is not, that means it is not in power during this time of the writing. And it is to rise from the bottomless pit, meaning it is to come. It will come in the future. So the Antichrist, right? And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains or hills on which the woman is seated. So this will be seven empires possibly. They are also seven kings, five of whom have already fallen, meaning Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. So those are the five that fell. One is, so at this time that would have been Rome, and the other has not yet come. So this being the reestablished Rome or whatever the city or the headquarters of the Antichrist is. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. So there's that limited authority. And as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. So this eighth empire being the state of the Antichrist, possibly. And the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. So we're looking here at the one world government. These are of one mind, so one world religion, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings 
And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So those who come with him are the heavenly army who have been called, chosen, and are faithful. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the 10 horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. Okay, wait, what? There's a reversal here going on. So basically, the 10 kings and the Antichrist are basically going to rise up and say, we don't need your one world religion anymore. We're done with you. So they're going to come against her and they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. So now they are turning themselves over to godless religion and godless rulers. So if you're left here confused, let's sum it up. Basically, there is going to be a city that rises up in great wealth, great power, great influence, and it will be under the power of the Antichrist. There will also be 10 nations that come alongside the Antichrist to rule with him. But once they get together, they are going to come against this particular city. So it was only flourishing for a limited amount of time. And this actually foreshadows the ultimate downfall of the Antichrist and his world power, as well as the final victory of God and his righteous judgment. Chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons. So essentially a virtual hell on earth, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So whatever this Babylon is, it is filled with idolatry and pride and greed and selfish wealth. You can actually think about cities nowadays that are, are like this, full of luxury, full of wealth, full of selfishness, full of greed. I might live in one. That doesn't mean that this is Babylon, but I'm just saying it puts you in the mindset that these kinds of cities actually exist, so it is not so far-fetched in Revelation. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So God remembers the iniquities of those who are unrepentant, whereas he forgives and does not remember the sins of those who believe. So when he is saying, come out of her. This is very similar to the way that he called Lot out of Sodom, the same way that he tells us not to be in a place where we shouldn't be. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. So she's going to get what she deserves. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. So if you really think about it, the most powerful cities nowadays, this is how you can picture it, being basically completely wiped out, maybe by a nuclear attack, and the rest of us in the world are going to be standing there like, whoa, this is going to seem so unbelievable. And that's what was happening here. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour, your judgment has come. And as I mentioned, nuclear could be the way that in a single hour, it could wipe out this particular quote city. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is human souls. And I was like, is that human trafficking? Because we don't see a whole lot of slavery nowadays. So these are obviously not necessities that will be coming from this place, but 
luxuries. And the fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. And the merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. So we do rejoice over the judgment of God, the righteous resolution, but we do not rejoice in the destruction that takes place because of this judgment. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea saying, so will Babylon, the great city be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. So essentially the world system will pass away and the sound of harpists and musicians of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more and the voice of a bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth and all nations were deceived by your sorcery or your pharmakeia, which is drugs or deception. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. So the slaying of the prophets and the saints and the martyrs are a personal offense to God which is why this righteous judgment is being brought down upon this great city. So basically we're seeing all of the worldwide corruption being swept away in just one hour. And this fall is only going to hurt those who had themselves invested in this system. And so when we take a look here at these last two chapters that we read, Both of them speaking of the great city Babylon being wiped out. And some people will say, well, this is the same. This is just one Babylon being taken out. Other people say, no, these are two very different or distinct things that are being taken out. So when we take a look here at the differences between the two, chapter 17, the symbol of the mystery of Babylon was a harlot. The identification was inland or possibly Rome. It was synonymous with a woman or whore or a mother. They were guilty of religious abomination, destroyed by political power that previously supported her. Whereas this commercial Babylon in chapter 18, the symbol of it was a great city. It is actually identified with a port city or a coastal city, and it is synonymous with a habitation, the great city, or a marketplace. It is guilty of greed and self-indulgence, and it is essentially destroyed by a sudden act of God. So we do see some differences there. So the conclusion that I come to is that these two things are intertwined, but they are still distinct. And overall encompassing the religious, the economic, and the political corruption that will be taking place here in the end. So again, we just thank you, Lord, for showing us today and reminding us of your victory, the ultimate victory that will take place. That everything that we see happening in this world today, everything that we might be feeling that is dragging us down, we know that there will be justice that happens. We still trust and fully know that you are in control and that you are sovereign over every event that is taking place. Thank you for easing our minds and our hearts today, knowing that everything has to take place in order to fulfill your word, your prophecy and ultimately your plan. We are so grateful more than ever, Lord, to be in your family of believers, to be marked by your Holy Spirit, to be protected by you, our refuge, our strong tower. And so I just pray today, Lord, that we will not lose hope, but that our faith is strengthened in what we have learned. If there is anything that convicted our hearts that we might be identifying ourselves with anything 
that was depicted here by this great city or by this Babylon, Lord, I pray that you will show us all the more so that we are able to turn away from it, to come up out of it the way that you have been calling us. And we know very well that you have been. So I just pray that we will be obedient to that, that we will walk away from it, flee from it, run from it and run toward you. We don't want to be caught in the deception or in the trap of the enemy. We don't want to be deceived any longer. And so I just pray that you will give us clarity of mind, that you will focus our eyes. May the spiritual blindness be gone in the name of Jesus. And I pray that our spiritual armor will be stronger than ever. Help us to endure. Help us to have that faithfulness that stands true and strong in the end. And so I thank you for equipping us today, Lord, on the second to last day of the year. May you be glorified in everything and all that we do because you are so worthy and so deserving of it. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.